You're about to learn so much about Evil Dead the game. In fact, let me show you some of the things we're going to be learning here. I have a giant list of stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read off a bunch of this, but I'm going to tell you why it matters. Because if I could read off a bunch of numbers, who cares, right? What does it actually mean in a game? What should I be doing with this information? That's what we're going to cover today. So in order to set up this whole video, we need to get a basic understanding of what the heck is going on with the weapons in this game. If you go ahead and you take a look, a lot of these weapons share three main stats, and that's going to be damage, dismemberment, and balance bar. So very literally, what this means is if I have 80 damage on my lumberjack axe, if I smack this guy, I'm going to do 80 damage. You can see the 80 pop in right there, okay? But now what you might also see here is dismemberment and balance bar. And dismemberment and balance bar are literally separate HP pools on these creatures. So if I hit this creature here, you'll see that white bar, that's their balance bar. That's their balance HP, which is separate from the damage that the weapon does, okay? The amount of damage, this 80, has nothing to do with the balance bar. Only listen to the balance bar if you're looking at balance bar damage. If you go into your skill tree and you just increase your general melee damage, it does not affect balance bar. They are separate things and they never touch each other. Something else to know about balance bar is you can see I can hit this guy here with a light attack, but something to know is that if you use a heavy attack, you actually get a huge bonus to your balance bar damage. And something you might be noticing here about heavy attacks is take a look at the amount of damage I'm doing. I do 80 with a light attack, right? Because that's what the damage of the weapon is. But if I do a heavy attack, I do 160. That's because the heavy attacks do double the damage. And not only is it double on the survivors, it's double for the demons as well. So if a demon uses a heavy attack on their possession, it's going to do double the damage of a light attack. So quite literally, how you should look at this is here's the health, here's the balance, here's the dismember. They each are a bar, and then once you get them to zero, something happens. If you get the health to zero, the creature dies. If you get the balance to zero, the creature gets stunned. If you get the dismember to zero, an arm falls off. Each one of these values is separate, and they never touch each other. Now, one other thing about damage that people might be wondering is, well, I see my damage go up the more I hit things. How does that work? The way that works is you have four attacks in your full combo, and you can mix and match those however you want. It could be light, 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 light. It could be light, heavy, light, heavy. It can be light, heavy, heavy, heavy. It can be whatever combo of four that you want, and that's your full combo. So what you'll see here is it goes one, and then two, and then three, and then four, and then it will start resetting the animation. And again, you can mix and match these. So I could do light and then a heavy. And then I'll go back into another light and then I'll finish up with a heavy. You can make any sort of combo with that. Now, what does that actually do? Well, if you take a peek here, I can hit for 80 and then this next one should be 88 and this next one should be 96 and the next one should be another eight on top of that. And then it'll reset back down to 80. So what it does is it keeps increasing the amount of damage you do by 10% of what the weapon's base damage is. So if your first hit's an 80, the next one's gonna be an 88 because 10% of 80 is eight, so you increase it. And then 20% of 80 is 16, which is why we had 96, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to 30%. And then if you go ahead and use a heavy attack here, what you'll see is 160, and then you'll see 168, and then you'll see 176. Now what's really interesting here is it's still going off of 10% of the base damage of the weapon even though I'm doing heavy attacks and heavy attacks double your final damage except with this for some reason now you might be wondering well why are you covering this this stuff is obscenely basic I mean maybe the things about the combos that you might not have known but yeah I get it health damage balance bar I already see it when I play the reason why it really matters is that there are hidden values in the game that are very briefly mentioned in this collection screen here if you go ahead and you read, it'll say warriors have more HP and they inflict more melee damage. Okay, well, what does that mean? Do they do more melee damage because when you look at their skill tree, you can just put more things into melee damage? Presumably, that would make sense. No, that is not what it means. It is much deeper than that and much more fundamental. And this is why you really need to pay attention to who picks up what weapon. There's nothing worse then when you have a hunter that picks up a lumberjack axe that's legendary you want to know why let me show you why i have it all typed out for you on this nice little image i made let's go pop on over to that image and what you'll see here is two different weapons we have a melee weapon and we have a ranged weapon something you need to know that fundamentally should change how you think about this game is classes have built-in modifiers for weapons not only do they have positive ones 
but they also have negative modifiers as well. All right, so even more so, it's really important that you give the warriors a good melee weapon and you give the hunters a good ranged weapon. Let me show you, which you can kind of already see here, how important it is. So let's take a look at the melee side. And we're going to assume that this random melee weapon here has a base damage of 100. You know how we saw 80 on the Lumberjack Axe before? Well, let's assume this one is 100 for ease of math. These are really easy numbers to work with. So if a leader is holding this melee weapon that does 100 damage, then the leader is going to do 100 damage because leaders do not have any built-in modifiers. However, if a warrior is holding this weapon, instead of doing 100 damage, they're going to do 150 damage. They do an extra 50% damage that is built into the character, fundamentally. <laughs> However, if a hunter is holding a melee weapon that does 100 damage, they're only going to do 70 damage. They have a built-in 30% debuff to their damage to make it so they're only going to do 70% of what it's capable of. It sucks when a hunter is holding a really good melee weapon because they just don't do a lot with it. And then if a support is holding this weapon that does 100 damage, they're only going to do 80. Really what this means is a leader is going to do exactly what the weapon says. Never mind if they have their own auras. We're ta not talking about auras right now. A warrior is going to do 50% more damage with that melee weapon. A hunter is going to do 30% less damage, and a support is going to do 20% less damage. So, you may as well give the warrior the really good weapon. Now, let's talk about the range side of things. Leaders are the same in range as they are in melee. They just do whatever the weapon says. Never mind the auras. A warrior, however, only does 50% of what the ranged weapon is capable of. So, if you ever see a Henry pick up a legendary boomstick, oh, God, you need to let out an audible scream because... It is so bad for your team, especially if you have a hunter that could be using it instead. Now, for the hunter damage, they actually do 50% more built in with a ranged weapon. So, you want to make sure they get a hold of those really strong ranged weapons. And then support is the same on both melee and ranged. They only do 80% of what the weapon is capable of. In case you need it spelled out for you here, I have it written down. You can pause the video, yada, yada, yada. Something to go and keep in mind here, though, is again, this is before the skill and pink F upgrades. Now, there's a ton of other things I learned in my testing here, so let's just start going through them, and we'll start with Annie here. Something to know about Annie is that she is listed incorrectly. It says, hit him where it hurts. When activated, your damage goes up by 100%. That's not true. It goes up by 30%. She is listed incorrectly. I'm assuming they're going to fix her so that it properly displays 30% in the menu here. I don't think they're going to fix Annie in a way where she starts doing 100% extra damage. I think 30% is where she's going to be at. Reason being is that that's where Arthur likes to sit with a lot of his skills, so that would just make a lot more sense. Speaking of Arthur, something that a lot of people ask me questions about is how does his skill work here with the sword thing? I don't really get it. So, we did the testing. Let me tell you what we figured out. So when activated, the ability increases the damage inflicted by your melee attacks and those of your teammates, in addition to reducing fear levels, yada, yada, yada. But if he has a sword, he inflicts extra damage. Okay, editing swing points here, and I have a lot more information than I initially planned to put in this video. So let's get Arthur figured out here, and then you'll see me interject with the rainbow shirt time and time again as this video progresses, okay? So something to know about Arthur straight out the gate is he's broken. There's something wrong with him where his aura, his passive one, is boosting the damage of ranged weapons around him at any given moment. So by 30%, by the way. So he's just this walking damage boosting monster right now. Now on the topic of how his sword specifically works. So let's say you have your sword and it does 80 damage, right? The way his aura works, his passive one is you just give another 30%. So Arthur typically with his gray sword is gonna be hitting 104. Now, specifically when he uses his active ability, he gets another 30%. So let's say he's not holding on to a sword and instead it's a lumberjack axe, which still does 80. So the way you would do this is you take the 80 and then you multiply it by 1.3 to get that 104 due to his passive, but then his active ability adds another 30%, all right? So that'll mean that Arthur's hitting for about 135 damage per swing, assuming he's not holding a sword. Now, if he is holding a sword, he gets an extra benefit only while he's using his active skill, okay? And then that my guess on how this works is that it just takes the base value of his sword damage and increases it by 20%. So what you'll see if you have a gray sword with Arthur is something like this. 
So you have 80 damage. And then, since he's holding a sword and you use the active ability, the active ability increases the base value of a sword by 20%. And then you go ahead and multiply by 1.3. And then you go ahead and multiply by 1.3 again due to his active. So Arthur with a gray sword, when his active ability is up, should be hitting for 162 damage per swing. Okay? I'm assuming that's how it works. If I'm wrong, someone please correct me. Now let's move on to warriors here. And there's actually something really important to know about all this. <laughs> like really important to know. You know how we just got done talking about how the classes have their own modifiers for health damage? It's like a warrior is going to do more than a leader or a hunter if it's a melee weapon, right? This only applies to health damage. Remember these three bars I told you about? There's health damage, balance damage, and dismember damage. It only applies to health damage. <laughs> So all things being equal, a warrior is not better at doing balance bar damage than a support or a hunter. So everybody should get involved equally when it comes to stumbling something because everybody does it the same. A really easy way to showcase this is if you have Henry on your team and then you have Kelly and you have a gray meat hammer on the ground. If you let Henry use it, he does whatever the meat hammer does for balance bar damage, I think 37, but then you let Kelly pick it up and she actually does better than Henry on the balance bar damage front because she has meat hammer proficiency or meat hammer weapon mastery. And again, I'm going to keep repeating why do we care about this? The reason why this matters is even though these characters have their built-in modifiers for HP, they don't have these built-in modifiers for balance bar, but that doesn't mean that a warrior can't outperform everybody else because they have a bunch of things in their skill tree. They can just out skill tree the other classes. You're not going to find a bunch of stuff in the hunter class here that's going to balance bar, balance bar, balance bar, balance bar for weapon melee. However, you will notice that in the warrior class because you'll see things here like balance bar damage of the blunt weapon, balance bar damage from your heavy melee attacks, balance bar damage from your melee attacks. The warriors get all these, the hunters don't, and classes mix and match and share these as appropriate. But in practice, again, what this means is everybody can work together equally to stun possessed creatures. Or another thing you might want to consider is maybe your Cheryl should hold a sledgehammer. Or maybe your Ed should hold a sledgehammer because that way they can still contribute a lot of balance bar damage. Especially since they're not going to be contributing a lot of actual health damage. Something a lot of people wonder about is what about these weapon master efficiencies here? You just said 30% for Kelly on her meat hammer. What is it for everybody else? I'm going to tell you what all the different numbers are, okay? So, Warrior Ash, he has a chainsaw efficiency. So if he has a chainsaw, he uses it better than anybody else in the game. Kind of. <laughs> so, <laughs> Wash's chainsaw efficiency here, or Weapon Master, whatever you want to call it, only increases his damage by 5%. That's it. That's it. 5%. It's negligible. It doesn't matter. So, in practice, what does this mean? Your chainsaw doesn't need to take priority over a really nice upgraded tier weapon of really any other class. Go ahead and just pick up what you want because 5% don't matter. Now, there is potential that maybe there's a much bigger bonus to dismemberment and balance bar and that maybe only health damage goes up by 5%, but I wasn't able to test that yet. I didn't find it out. And frankly, testing with other characters makes it seem like that's not going to be the case. Now, what about Scotty? People are ranting and raving about Scotty. He's so good with the Lumberjack Axe. You just got to give with the axe, man. Same case, Scotty's Lumberjack efficiency is only 5%. But now let's talk about the efficiencies on the Hunters here. Hash here has a 20% efficiency on his double barrel. Pretty nice. 20% is 20%. And again, something to keep in mind with all of these efficiencies is that it is health damage, attack speed, balance bar, and dismemberment. All of these different categories get a buff. So, again, that is how Kelly's able to outperform something like Henry on balance bar damage because classes don't benefit from balance bar damage. However, these masteries do. Okay? So, double barrel is 20%. Ed here, he uses the crossbow for his weapon mastery. Also 20%. Amanda here uses the pistol. She also has a 20% weapon efficiency. Now, Kelly here is the weird one because she has a melee. And then what this does is it makes it so her meat hammer is 30% better. This is probably where some of the rumors came in with Wash and Scotty about 30%. Kelly's is 30%. Now, you might be wondering, well, isn't that kind of backwards, though? <laughs> because if you go and you take a look at what we just said before with all of the different categories here, well, wh why would Kelly... What? Why would Kelly get 
30% here because let's say you have a meat hammer, a great meat hammer. Well, if Kelly is only going to do 70% of that, well, you multiply that by 0.7, right? Because she's a hunter. However, when Kelly comes back in swinging with her 30%, what you'll see is that she does 34, I guess. So Kelly actually does less damage <laughs> than what the meat hammer says it does. She's terrible with it on a health damage front. But again, balance bar damage is non-class specific. So, something to know about the meat hammer here is that it does 37 balance bar damage. And since it's not class specific, we don't have to run it through this 0.7 first. We just keep it at 37. So that means that Kelly gets that 30% buff. So she's actually doing 48 balance bar damage every time she swings that thing. And again, she swings it faster than anybody else does too. This is the power for Kelly here. And 48, does that matter? Yes, it does. Because a lot of the balance bars here on these basic units are around 40 to 44. This is about what we've noticed. So then suddenly, Kelly is able to one-shot F-chain into creatures here when she's using a meat hammer. Henry can't do that. Wash can't do that with a meat hammer. But Kelly can. This is where the power of the meat hammer comes in for Kelly. One other quick number that I have for you is how much does the Shems heal? People always wonder, well, how much does the Shems heal at base? About 450. That's what I'm going to give you. <laughs> about 450. I did pixel measuring. I did a couple sub sample sizes and it was about 450-ish. In case you don't know, each one of these classes has a different amount of HP. So leaders have 1,000 HP at base. Warriors have 1,300 HP at base. Hunters have 900 HP at base. And then supports have 900 HP at base. So use that 450 in your mind however you like it. Oh, and actually something else to know. I was learning while I was testing stuff. Couple of cool things about Sash here. This is totally off topic. So this whole mark target healing, what I learned is that headshots will mark a target. A follow-up shot from a teammate will restore a percentage back to them as health. This works on melee. So if you shoot him in the head and then well, bam, hit him with a melee weapon, they'll heal a little bit. I didn't think that was gonna be the case, but that's what I was noticing when I was testing things specifically on Sash here. Another cool thing about this is if you keep shooting something in the head over and over again as Sash, you will heal every single time. You don't have to hit him in the head and then do a body shot. Hit him in the head and then do a body shot. If you do consecutive shots, everything after that first shot's gonna heal you. So shot and then heal and then heal and then heal and then heal and then heal. So this is really nice if you can get something stumbled, you can just blow into its head and then get a lot of healing off of it, okay? As long as you keep hitting it in the head. Headshots do 80% more damage whenever you hit something in the head. And also they do increased balance bar damage. So there's a lot of incentive to go ahead and hit something in the head. And now let's start getting into some of the demon things here. Cause I'm sure you guys are curious about some of the demon numbers. I don't have everything hashed out on these demons, but enough to get you started to make you think a little bit more about how you build out your tree and how much damage you're doing, yada, yada, yada. Okay. So one thing to know about demons right away is if you possess a survivor, that survivor is going to do half the amount of damage when you shoot someone. So let's say you possess a survivor and they hold a gun that does hundred damage. Well, if you shoot someone else on their team, you're going to do 50 damage to them. Okay. It's half, which is actually a really big deal because if you possess a warrior and then you start shooting everybody, you're going to do like no damage. So it's super embarrassing. Go ahead and play to the strength of the class. But now let's get into a little bit of the damage numbers here because I actually recorded all of these, I think. So they have a light attack, they have a heavy attack, and then they have their abilities. So let me tell you what these all do. The light attack on the basic unit for the warlord. Again, this is all base values, no skill tree, no nothing. It only goes up from here. The light attack does 75 damage and the heavy attack does 150. Cause again, heavy attacks always double. That just seems to be a theme. However, you can make the light attack go up to 80 and the heavy attack go up to 160 if they are holding a weapon. So that's if sometimes they spawn with an ax, that's how you make that happen. That's also how the farewell to arms thing kicks in. Because if you rip off one of your arms, well then that counts as a weapon. So your light attacks are gonna do 80 and your heavy melee attacks are gonna do 160. Doesn't really seem worth it because it's not a huge damage boost and then you lose one of your arms, which means you're more vulnerable to dismemberment, but that's what it does. The puke does 17 damage per tick blah, 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 at base. And then it only goes up from there. Also, it costs 20 infernal energy to possess one of these basic units. Reason why this matters is this is not all created equal here. And we'll find that out when we go to the puppeteer. Now the Deadite Elite, this light attack here does 80, 90 if they're holding a weapon, because sometimes it can spawn with an ax. And then again, the heavy attacks 160, 180 if they're holding a weapon. Now the Deadite Smash does 120 when they hit the ground. And then the big swing does 120, but it can do 135 if they're holding a weapon, okay? 
Now, let's move on to the puppeteer here. Oh, also something I should have mentioned here is that possessing an elite unit on your warlord here costs 30. Now, I initially wasn't going to cover the bosses here, but editing swing point is back with information that I'm sure you're curious about. So the damage that Henrietta does with her attacks, her light attack does 100 damage per swing. Her heavy attack does 200 because again, it doubles. There's one exception to the doubling rule. We'll talk about that later. Belly Flop does 150 damage in an AoE. The Gas Leak does 45 damage per tick. That's her big fart. And then the Granny Hug, I couldn't see the numbers on that one. But if you take a look at the Puppeteer, it does about 200 damage total. And then Evil Ash does 150 damage total. So I'm assuming Henrietta's kind of in the same ballpark of in between 150 to 200-ish, give or take. Okay? So the basic Puppeteer unit here is 35 on a Light Attack, which is terrible. It's like the worst in the game by a lot. <laughs> And then the heavy attack, again, is doubled, goes up to 70. Something to know about the heavy attack, though, is that it can actually hit twice. So it's 70 and then 70, so it could be 140. Self-destruct, I don't have a number on that because it's really hard to see the number when you blow yourself up. <laughs> head rush does, oh, head rush does about 100 damage. I did have this weird thing happen where I threw my head, it did 100, and then did another 150. Don't know how that happened, but it does 100, and then maybe that explosion that it says can also do 150. We'll see. But that's what I have for you. And now onto the demi Elegos here. Oh, actually, something to note before I leave the Dead Eye Berserker here is that possessing a Dead Eye Berserker costs 40, which is terrible. I don't know why they did that. Especially when you consider a demi Elegos only costs 30 to possess. So I don't know if that's a mistake or what's going on, but 40 on a Dead Eye Berserker is disgusting. Light attack on a demi Elegos here does 50. A heavy attack does 100. Thunderstruck here also does 100. These are all base values. You can make these things go sky high if you go and upgrade your skill trees. Okay? I'm back. Editing swing points back. Okay, so <laughs> light attack on Eligos does 60 damage. His heavy attack is actually an AoE, like a big one, and it does 200 damage. So this breaks the whole double the damage rule that we've had with everything else. Light attack is 60, heavy attack is 200. His telekinetic surge, that big push that he does, lightning around him, is 200. The casting stones, which I don't know if you ever actually hit these... <laughs> hits for 160 and then the psychic squeeze is 200 damage because it's 100 damage per tick so reason why the per tick matters is because you can knock him out of this attack now let's move on over to the necromancer base values on a lot of these attacks these are actually really interesting attacks so basic unit if i recall actually you know what i have them all written down here the light melee on a basic unit is 70 the heavy melee is 140 the lunging thrust is 140 damage okay war cry here Turns out, I did more testing with this, this skill is bugged out of its mind, which is probably part of the reason why people can stop so hard with the war, or not the warlord, the necromancer basic unit. Okay, you ready to hear some of this? So what we just talked about was that light attack is 70, and then heavy attack is 140, and then lunging thrust is 140. Now the war cry here is an AoE. So he puts his pole arm into the ground and it does 84 damage at base, okay? Now, if you are too close to the basic Necromancer unit here, it's going to do additional damage because the polearm hits you. Now, that number that it hits you with is... it varies a lot. So, you're either going to get hit for 84 plus 70, or you're going to get hit by 84 plus 140, or, heck, maybe even 84 plus 161. Why is this changing so much? I believe it's bugged. Here's what's going on. So, <laughs> if you happen to get hit by the polearm, aka you're just too close to the war cry when it slams down, it will duplicate the damage based off of what, of what other attack the necromancer used before then. So, if you did a light attack and then you did a war cry, it'll do 70 and 84. If you did a heavy attack and then the war cry, it'll do 140 and 84. If you did a lunging thrust, it'll do 140 and 84. If you do a, a combo, because by the way, these combos are different on this Necromancer basic unit. You can do a three combo on a light attack. You can do a four combo on a heavy attack. Let's say you're on your fourth combo of the heavy attack and then you do your war cry. It's going to be like 160 something plus 84. So it just duplicates whatever the last attack you did or whatever that last attack's damage would have been. That's probably part of the reason why they're a little busted feeling right now. Because they are. <laughs> now, let's move on to the heavy unit here. Oh, actually, something to know about these units, by the way, is you see that shield? That shield actually acts as something that really protects their HP. You got to get that shield out of the way. If you hit the shield, your 
<laughs> you're not going to do as much damage as you probably could. And it actually does matter. If you hit them on the shield versus hitting them on the opposite side while they're still holding the shield, you'll do more damage if you hit them on the opposite side. So try to avoid the shield if you can. Shoot them in the leg, shoot them in the arm. All right? Now, elite units, they also have a shield, same talk. Their light attacks do 90. Their heavy attacks do 180, because again, it doubles. Their trident smash does 162. And then their trident toss does 150 damage. And again, keep all of this stuff in mind with the HP values of the survivors here. 900 for supports, 900 for hunters, 1300 on warriors, 1000 on leaders. So you're doing quite a bit of chunk of their health. And then on the topic of possession, the basic unit here costs 20 to possess, and then the skeleton elite costs 30 to possess. So again, super weird that the puppeteer is so expensive on their basic units. Editing swing points back onto Evil Ash. So <laughs> light attack does, I believe, 80, and then the heavy attack does 160. He doesn't really have a bunch of other attacks. So I'll explain a little bit about how the skeletal resurrection works. From what I could gather, the skeletal resurrection just pings any skeleton that walked within that aura while it was happening and then persists on the skeleton until it dies and then it comes back okay that's how i think it works on to infernal invigoration here i don't know how much it heals evil ash but considering it only does a max of 150 damage it's probably not that amazing all right editing swing point here back one more time to answer all the questions that people have about this area because i know there's a lot of well does this work with this let me tell you what i learned so Possessions. Possessions affect anything that you control as a demon. So that means basic units. That means elite units. That also means when you possess a human. So you know how we did the whole, the weapon does 100 and then the possession does half? Well, then you go ahead and factor in all these numbers in here. Also, possession damage affects the boss in case you were wondering. So you can get this massive 40% damage buff for the boss as well. From what I could tell though, the possession stuff only affects the light attacks and the heavy attacks of the boss. Okay, a little weird. All right, so let me possess this right here and take a look at our skill tree. So currently what happens with this possessed unit is it's doing an extra 5% damage because we have one point in possession. However, you can add points while you're in the possession and they will start reflecting in the unit you currently have possessed. You don't have to repossess a new unit in order to make the possession stuff kick in. However, you do have to make a new boss show up in order for the boss damage to kick in. Okay? Um, if I wasn't clear, go ahead, rewind it. But again, possession, you can just add while you're in the possession. Boss, the upgrades will not kick in until your next boss for some reason. And possession stuff affects light attacks and heavy attacks on the boss. Doesn't affect their things like their belly flop or their hugs or anything like that. The damage you see in here on the boss will work on light attacks, heavy attacks, and their abilities. Okay? So let's keep going down the things that people often ask me about is, well, okay, what about portal units? What if you have all these upgrades on the portal? Five damage, 10 damage, 15 damage. Will that make it stronger when I possess it? No. This damage is, I guess, only for the AI. If you go ahead and possess some schmo on the street over here, you see this one walking, you are going to get the bonus of your possession damage here, and that's it. If I were to go ahead and spawn a portal and then take one of these guys instead, same difference. This bonus that you get in here does not go ahead and reflect in the damage when you are possessing it. It might go ahead and make it stronger when it's just running around by itself as an AI, but possessed units do not benefit off of Portal Basic. Okay? So this was a lot. I hope it was helpful to you. A lot more than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> and if you guys have any other things that you know about the game, please put them in the comments down below. We're just trying to educate everybody here, make sure everybody's on the same page. I stream just about every single night, twitch.tv slash swingpoint. Link will be in the description, also the top comments. Come talk to the game, or come talk to me about the game on stream. And if you found this video helpful, please go ahead and consider subscribing. We cover this type of stuff all the time and you'll just keep learning more and more and more about the game like i said we're going to do the really sweaty pro tip type of stuff in a future video so thank you guys for being here you guys are awesome and then i'll see you in the next video that we do around here